Hope everybody is ready to learn about Louis Pasteur and Joshua Lederberg. Presented to you by Allison, other Allison, Madeline, Carolyn, and yours truly, Tori. My name doesn't rhyme. All right, so let's get down into the good stuff. Louis Pasteur's early life and history. So first, Louis Pasteur was born in the city of Dole, France on December 27, 1822. He then moved to the city of Arbois um, at the age of four. His father was a sergeant in the Napoleon War and was decorated with the Legion of Honors and then he later retired to become a tanner and worked with leather. His mother was Jean Editine uh, Recoy, can never get those French names down. Um, but he also had two older sisters, and uh, his parents raised him to cherish loyalty, financial security, and to especially be a hard worker later on in life, which is shown throughout uh, his legacy. He was married to a woman named Marie, and he ended up having five children. However, only two of them survived to adulthood, which <coughs> encouraged his desire to work hard and find a cure for vaccinations and uh, continued his pursuit. He also, even though he was a scientist, he was a very excelled art artist and loved painting pastel portraits, and this is actually a portrait that he had painted at the age of 15 of his own father. He then later on died in 1895, when through a series of strokes that started in 1869 all the way up till his death, and then he passed away. So his schooling. Uh, he started his education at the age of eight at a primary school called Ecole Primaire uh, that met in actually the town hall of his home city, which is right here. And he had a personal tutor back home that was his father's family friend, actually, and his dad had taught him how to read and write and such before he started uh, actual schooling. So when he was a student, he excelled greatly throughout his academic career. At the age of 15, he moved out to Paris to attend the Barbet Institute, but he got severe homesickness and only lasted two weeks. I personally think he probably had one of those roommates that uh, ate a little too much ramen and might not have had the best personal hygiene. We've all had one of those, um, so homesickness might be a cover. Uh, but a year later, at the age of 16, he then attended the Royal College and graduated in 1840, where he then worked there for two years as a TA. He wanted to go back to Paris to uh, reattend that school that he dropped out of, but painting ended up to be his demise, and he failed the entrance exam, and he had to study an extra two years, took extra classes, gave up painting for a large portion of it until he passed with flying colors. Uh, he then got his science degree at the age of 22, and he started his research on from there. He got third place on this special physics exam uh, for teachers, but teaching was not his stuff. He didn't want to do it. He hated it. Uh, however, a chemistry professor by the name of Antoine uh, picked him up, saw his work, loved it, gave him a position as a teacher's assistant. And so he could continue on his research to later on earn his doctorate uh, later on in his life. Uh, after he was awarded his PhD, he was given a job at the University of Strasbourg in 1847. So then in his career, after all of that, in 1854, he became the Dean of Sciences at Lilly University, where he started his research on fermentation. Uh, three years later, he actually left that university, moved back to Paris, See a little like correlation there. Uh, and he became the Dean of Sciences at ENS, where he served for over 10 years. And in 1862, he then became a professor for geology, chemistry, and physics. Five years later, in 1867, he resigned from that university to solely focus on his research. Sadly, this is about the time where his seizures and strokes started happening, and then he ended up dying. So uh, he received many awards throughout his life, such as the Roman Ford Medal, Montean Prize, Copley Medal, and the Leon Work Medal, which is a huge one for microbiology. So he left quite a legacy. Okay, we're going to get into some of the problems that Pastor began to solve for us. So he began his research as part of his doctoral program, and so he chose to work with the structure of tartrate and 
copper tartrate, and they're, those are crystals, and I have trouble many times at this time. And so at age 32, he went to Lille and researched fermentation. In 1857, he became the director of E. coli Normal Scientific Studies, working with the theory of spontaneous generation. He continued to work with fermentation and pasteurization, and he wanted to stop wine from spooling, which was a big problem in the area that he lived in because most of the families distilled wine and used wine. He also helped in the silk industry with diseased eggs, and then in 1855, a small boy was bitten by a rabies jaw, and so he had began his research in the rabies vaccine, and so he tested his vaccine, vaccine during this time. So some of the main things that he solved is disproving spontaneous generation. So during this time, it was very conflicting. <coughs> Some people thought spontaneous generation happened, and then others thought differently. So um, Pasteur created a U-shaped flask, and so in the flask, he boiled um, the broth to kill the bacteria, and that prevented the microorganisms in the broth. And then he would leave it for several days to see if there were any microorganisms um, in the broth, and they ended up being in the U-shaped part of the flask, and then he tipped it to allow the microorganisms to enter the broth. And so this proved that bacteria was not spontaneously generated, and it was brought in through the air. So he also worked in fermentation, and because of his work with spontaneous generation, he learned more about microbes, which helped to explain the process of fermentation. So again, many scientists during this time had conflicting ideas about why this happened, and some people just thought it was the chemicals within the solution. So Pasteur discovered the fermentation could only happen in the presence of microbes. So if you had good microbes, then it gave a good result. And then if you had bad microbes, then it gave a bad result. So you don't want bad microbes because then it gave you bad wine. So the presence um, of good microbes is a good thing. And then the, this research and the understanding of microbes is what created the branch of microbiology. So vaccinations are very important because we still use those today, even though there are some conflicting ideas about if we should vaccinate our children and if it causes further diseases. So in 1882, he began his research on vaccination, specifically rabies and animals that were infected. So he researched animals and he realized that it took a long time for the disease to actually reach the brain where it was affecting the body of the animal. And so this led to a better understanding of giving vaccines after the person was exposed to whatever disease that animal might have. So in 1885, the vaccine was tested on a little boy who had been bit by a dog. And so the vaccine ended up being successful. And so in 1888, the Pasteur Institute was established and it continued the research for disease prevention, and Pasteur was able to mentor those conducting the research. So I'm gonna to talk to you about <coughs> Joshua Lederberg and his life. So he was born on May 23rd, 1925 in Montclair, New Jersey. Um, his father was an Orthodox rabbi, and his father originally thought that his son would follow in his footsteps, but Lederberg was convinced that he wanted to be like Einstein. So he grew up in Manhattan. Um, from K to 12, he went to the Manhattan schools. Um, and he then pursued college at Columbia University, and he started to study zoology from 1941 to 1944, which is a pre-med program. Um, then he went to med school from 1944 to 1946, also at Columbia. Then he went on to Yale and studied microbiology and botany from 1946 to 1948, and he graduated in 1948 with a PhD. Um, as for his personal life, he married Esther M. Zimmer in 1946 while they were at school at Yale. Um, they didn't have any children, and unfortunately they got divorced in 1966, and then he remarried two years later to Marguerite Stein Kirsch in 1968, and they had two children, um, one biological and then one stepchild. 
Um, as for his career, he was very accomplished. So he originally went to um, the University of Wisconsin and was an assistant professor of genetics there. Um, he was a chairman at the University of Wisconsin from 1957 to 1959. Um, and in 1959, he was recruited to go to Stanford and organize their genetics department there. Um, in 1962, he was a director for lab molecular medicine there. Um, he was also a visiting professor at University of Cal California, Berkeley, and he was a Fulbright visiting professor at Melbourne, Australia. Um, he was also elected to the National Academy of Sciences, and he was a chairman of the Institute of Medicine, and he was also a chairman of the President's Cancer Panel. In 1975, he was involved in the NASA Viking mission to Mars, so he developed instruments to detect microbes on Mars. Um, from 1978 to 1990, he was the professor and a president of the Rockefeller University in New York City. He was also a consultant on the World Health Organization's Advisory Health Research Council. Um, as for his accomplishments, in 1958, he won the Nobel Prize for Research in Genetic Structure and Function in Microorganisms. In 1989, he won the U.S. National Medal of Science. And then in 2006, he was given the Presidential Medal of Freedom by George W. Bush. Um, he also published over 300 articles and was the editor of many, many textbooks. Um, and then unfortunately, he died on February 2nd, 2008 due to pneumonia. So he kept his work very close to him. And unfortunately, you know that saying, keep your friends close, but your enemies closer, he really took that to heart. Or should I say his lungs? Hi. That bacteria is pretty scary, right? Well, before the 1940s, it was actually even scarier because the researchers back then didn't have the methods to study its sexual stage. So that picture is of E. coli, and it's being um, infected by a virus. So those are the little tails. And Joshua's letter be, Letterberg's research was really relevant to this in bacterial genetics. So he began his research in high school because he was super interested in chemistry and science. So he studied cytochemistry, and then he studied um, neurospora, which was a bread mold. And after that, he ended up studying blood smears from US Marines who were returning from a campaign and he was looking for malaria and chromosomes of the plasmodium parasite. And the sexual stages in the malaria parasite suggested to him the possibility of sexual stages in other microbes. Infectious diseases and microbial threats to health were a problem previously unable to be studied because they didn't have the methods or the knowledge to do so. So this encouraged him to advance his understanding of microbial genetics. In his career, he made two major discoveries. So his first discovery was bacterial conjugation. So this picture right here is actually of bacterial conjugation. And um, each <coughs> bacteria has like a line where they're transferring their um, genetic information. So the two cells of opposite mating strains come together. And this is actually a picture of E. coli as well. So in his discovery of conjugation, Lederberg found that genes are transferred in an orderly manner from one bacterial cell to another. And he also found out that time was a factor, which suggested that the donor cell transferred a single linear chromosome at a uniform rate to the recipient, and that he could map out the bacterial chromosome. And he also found that he could actually dis disrupt the mating process at regular intervals to be able to analyze the deficiencies and new capabilities of recipient cells. So for his second discovery, he discovered transduction and transduction is actually where carrier viruses transfer fragments of genes from one bacterial host cell to another. So in his research, he studied E. coli and the bacteriophage P1, and a bacteriophage is a virus that infects bacteria. So to reproduce, viruses infect living, living cells with their genetic material and then use the internal structures of the host cells to replicate their genetic information. And sometimes, while they're replicating their viral information, a piece of the host cell's DNA can get stuck in the viral cuspid. And then when the virus leaves that cell and goes to a second cell, genetic information from the first cell gets transferred to the second cell. And that changes its genetic makeup. So he also used this process to map genes to the bacterial chromosome.
So his research was super helpful. He played a key role in studies of the genetic components of bac pathogenic bacteria and viruses, and he also discovered how bacterial sexual stage allowed understanding of the biological significance of their genetics because they weren't even able to study that before. So he laid the foundation for how to study molecular organization and the function of genes. And he also substantiated the idea that bacteria have a genetic system, which they didn't even know before him. And he showed how long-term and hereditary effects can be caused by viral genes becoming incorporated in a, into host cell DNA through transduction. Hey everyone, so I'm back to wrap everything up for you all. Um, so when I was learning all of that, um, I was a little confused on how these two guys related because Lederberg and Pasteur are two very different people. Um, Lederberg is from the East Coast um, during the 1900s and Pasteur is from France in the 1800s. These two guys didn't live together at the same time. They didn't even speak the same language. Um, and they studied pretty different things. They were both studying microbiology, but Lederberg was studying um, bacterial, um, like sexual reproduction, while Pasteur was studying all kinds of other stuff. Um, so how do their, how do these two relate? How do their research relate? Well, um, Pasteur's germ theory and vaccinations led to the prevention of diseases which led to a decrease in mortality. More people were living. Similarly, Lederberg's bacterial conjugation study um, led to a better understanding and thus prediction of disease processes um, based on germ theory, leading to a better prevention of disease and reduced mortality. Did you look at that? Um, Pasteur laid the foundation for Lederberg's work um, because if it weren't for Pasteur's germ theory, no one would even be focusing on bacteria or microbes in general um, as the disease-causing agents. Um, an example of how Pasteur shaped Lederberg's work is E. coli. Um, before Pasteur's work, E. coli was probably just thought to be um, a part of food um, and spontaneously generated on certain foods. However, Pasteur uh, disproved spontaneous generation um, as you guys learned, a little review session. Um, and so uh, germ theory supported that the bacteria grew on it, and then uh, or Lederberg then studied that bacteria to figure out how it reproduced. Um, and basically, these two guys just had the same goal altogether, reduce mortality, keep people alive, keep people healthy. And isn't that everybody's goal? So the impact um, these two dudes had on science today is significant. Um, obviously tons of medical advances um, such as vaccines. Pasteur in his lifetime worked on four different vaccines. There are hundreds of vaccines out there today to keep us all healthy. Um, they also uh, provided um, a better understanding and prevention of antibiotic resistance. Or, um, bacterial resistance of antibiotics. So bacteria, when it fights against the antibiotics, so how do we deal with that? Um, and finally, germ theory provided a starting point for lots of disease research, not just for E. coli, not just for Lederberg's work, for all kinds of other medical professionals' research. Um, and finally, the Pasteur Institute still exists in Paris. So the next time you go to Paris, check it out. Forget about the Eiffel Tower. Go straight to Pasteur Institute. I'm sure it's a super fascinating name. Um, so anyway, these two dudes laid the groundwork for tons of research in not just medicine, but obviously in other sciences such as biology, um, microbiology, um, diseases, vaccines, and there's plenty of research still be, to be done. For instance, malaria doesn't have a vaccine yet. Work on that. Um, okay, and then finally, their impact on society, lower mortality, more people are living uh, because vaccines help prevent disease. Also, germ theory taught us that maybe we should wash our hands. Um, there are ways, better hygiene practices to prevent disease. Um, and finally, societal changes because we have all these extra people alive, all these older people living longer. And then next, safer foods um, became available via pasteurization 
and um, fermentation. We're a less agriculture society. Um, food has to be transported. It affects our economy. Also, life as we know it. Cheese is pretty important to American culture. Without pasture, we wouldn't have it. Um, and finally, more jobs. There's tons of research left to be done. Their um, Lederberg and Pasteur's work asked, it brought up more questions than it brought up answers. There's all these doors to be opened, left. Um, there's all these diseases um, still to find cures for, and just lots of work to be done in microbiology. Hope you learned something today. Um, yeah.